screen now. Sweet. Yes. yes. Yes, and thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy for this opportunity to speak on things that are dear to my heart. Um, I run this uh, climate company. And of course, the background is, is not fun. Uh, that is the, the climate crisis. This is the latest physical science report from IPCC that came out at the end of last year. Um, and it is really clear in its message. Um, people, of course, sometimes have been speaking about whether it was all man-made or whether it was something that was um, that was uh, uh, um, natural. And um, there was some, some uh, um, writing about the IPCC report being, so to speak, um, new and serious and so on. The, the truth of the matter is that there was very little new in the IPCC report for the very simple fact that our reason that the predictions of climate have become very, very good over the years. So there wasn't any big need to make any changes. It's all uh, phrased slightly differently and so on, but in the substance, it is not very different. The main thing that I noticed that was different was this set of curves, um, which shows on the right-hand side uh, a better than before um, um, a representation of the observed uh, climate and the uh, climate if we had only had the natural causes, such as Mount Pinatubo in, in the Philippines, uh, lowering the temperature for a few years and, and solar activity and what have you. And what we see on the right-hand curve is a gap. The observed climate and what would have been the case if it was purely natural. And that led to the most um, straightforward novelty of the IPCC report, which is instead of saying it is extremely likely that it is caused by human activity, where they this time changed it to it is caused by human activity. So that ambiguity, which was always there for, science, uh, for reasons of scientific uh, propriety or, or, or reason has gone away. It is about us. And then what the IPCC report goes on to, to show are some future emission scenarios, and they all have fancy names, but they show how, how could it develop. You could have a scenario that where we reduce emissions very fast, and we could have scenarios where we only reduce slower or very slowly. And then they have some views on, on other uh, non-CO2 gas types. And it's clear that if you're worried about the climate, you would want us to be on some of those trajectories. We are at the present time in that trajectory. We'll hope to get to that. And that's very much not good. Um, if you look at these various scenarios, what we see here is on the left, the total uh, um, a, a, a temperature change made uh, caused by a, a, a mixture of CO2, the non-CO2 elements, and then something that subtracts. And that is when we make many aerosols. The most common aerosol that have been subtracting is um, sulfur dioxide, which is a, 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 um, an end product of, of a fuel used in ships. That actually has a cooling effect. But unfortunately, as you can see, not nearly enough. We all like to be down here. And today we are somewhere like that, maybe like that. And what should be clear is that if we ever get to something like three and a half degrees increase, we are in totally unknown land. There's no way of knowing how bad that will be, but it will be very, very bad. So that's where we are. Um, and then I use, when I speak about the debate here in Denmark about what to do, I use a metaphor, uh, which is a, 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 a little picture of the situation. And in this picture, we pretend that I own a house. And I own that house with some people. And we have this handshake deal that if we want to make any substantial changes or efforts or activities in our joint house, 
then um, then uh, we need to be in agreement about it. And then one day the house catches fire and we all get out, stand on the street. I happen to have a, a hose with water. It has a nozzle and I can turn on the nozzle. Um, and then um, I say, shouldn't we put out the fire? Do you agree? And then my friends give their opinion. One says, ah, I'm not sure there is a fire. It could be something else making all that noise and uh, uh, smoke and and the glare that we can see in the background. And actually, I don't think it's very important. We should look at the waste on the other side of the street. That's much more disturbing. And then another one says, well, if you turn on the water, it's really very expensive. It'll cost you three pounds a cubic meter. Uh, we need to think really carefully about spending that sort of money. And then a third one says, ah, I heard about somebody who was doing research into uh, 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 matters that are good at putting out fires. Somebody said that they might come up with something that's better than water within the next 10 to 15 years. Shouldn't we, uh, shouldn't we uh, speak with them? And then a fourth one says, well, you know, my room is up near where you're going to spray with water. And then my windows will get misty and I wouldn't like that. It will hurt my view. And then a the fifth one says, um, ah, you know, if we start using water for this, somebody else might want to use water for something other. And then we open a can of worms. Let's not start that. And then I uh, come to think that the kids are in the house. And the good question is, what do I do then? And this is not for fun. Because in the Danish debate on climate change, we have had the climate skeptics saying there is no climate change. We have had the people saying, yeah, we would really like to do something about it as long as it doesn't cost money. And there I, I come to think of situations we've had in, in, in my little country in, in 1814, um, universal schooling was introduced. From then on, all children were expected to go to school. And can you imagine somebody's arguing at that time? Yes, I actually think it would be good for society if we could all go to school. And we all agree that it would be a, a, a fine thing as long as it doesn't cost any money. If somebody had said in 1870, rumors from London are that if we separate sewage from drinking water, we won't get cholera. And they're having something, they actually call them sewers that help do that. And somebody has said, bright idea, as long as it doesn't cost any money. Or if somebody had said, and then you can insert roads, university, electricity, hospitals, whatever. And the argument always has been, fine idea. It would improve our standard of living, but it must not cost anything. Why is it then that we are meeting that argument when we have the most existential problem of our generation? Of course, we all know now, more than we knew six weeks ago, that the nuclear threat has put up its ugly head again. But generally speaking, in my generation and in your generation and in our children's generation, it will all be about the climate. Why, why do we then meet that argument? The argument about somebody figuring out solutions maybe in 10 to 15 years, of course, is there all the time and it makes no sense whatsoever. The argument about spoiling the view is there all the time. And of course, you have to take, take it seriously up to a certain limit. And then the argument about opening a can of worms is something I actually meet very substantially um, these days. Um, in Denmark, we have a fairly high penetration with wind power. And, um, occasion, and actually not occasionally, regularly or quite often, wind turbines are shut down because the load does not match the production. And then turbines are shut down and the owners are paid a compensation. You could argue that it would then make sense to let them operate and have somebody at somewhere else on the grid produce hydrogen with the excess power. And that would help a lot if that could be done without paying a, a transmission tariff. So why not let them run? 
the, the uh, system operator, the Danish TSO, as we call it, they make money out of transmission charges. If the turbines were standing still because they were curtailed, then they make no money. If the turbines are operating and they do not require a transmission charge, then they also make no money, but they help us produce gas that can substitute Russian gas. And there their comment is, ah, let's not open that can of worms because then other people will want to use, uh, want to ask also for relief from the transmission charges. Ah, we can't see through that. These things are really happening. So it is not always easy. Anyway, turning to our company, um, we work on climate change mitigation. That is what we do as our main purpose. Our secondary purpose is job creation. We have in Denmark, uh, unfortunately, we have a very good employment situation. Um, we have a, a, a like something like the lowest unemployment rate in my lifetime now. So in that way, labor uh, and jobs is not an issue, but it is an issue after all that skilled labor is moving out to China, that unskilled labor tends to be more and more in service jobs and less and less in production jobs. And there's something wrong in us not producing uh, our own uh, uh, goods. And then, of course, you cannot run a company without having investors, and they need some sort of shareholder value growth. That's how it is. So that's what we do. Um, our purpose, our targets, we would like to facilitate annual reductions of 500 million tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030. That's an absurdly high number. It's, it's, it's bizarre. Denmark emits something like uh, 30 million tons this year. Um, 500 million tons is like so, sort of German-like or France-like or whatever. To do that as a small company, uh, have that as your contention makes no sense at the first glance. But what it says is facilitate. And we take that seriously. That means that it's about licensing technologies. It's also about supplying some of it, but it's also about counting if a Chinese company, and I apologize if any of you feel it's unfair, but it's, it's, it's been known in this world that Chinese companies took inspiration from Western company. If a Chinese company should copy some of our technologies, then we'll also count that as something we facilitated in order to get to our, our 500 million tons. And when you start up a company like this, you spend money, you don't make money. So at some point in time, we of course need to start making money and there our target is to, to do that by 24. We, what we do is that we have approached it in a certain way. We only work with stuff that matters. We only work with things that are suitable for industrialization. I'll get back to that. And then we only work with something that fits to us. And the last thing, you can say, what, what is that? In our case, it's about working with things that somebody who has a past in the wind industry, like me and many of our key colleagues, can do. And we work with, we, wind people work with fiberglass, steel, concrete, copper wires, tra uh, transformers, electric generators, gearboxes, and so on, control systems. We don't work with apps. We don't work with platforms in the sense of Uber taxi-like thing being a platform. Some people speak about blockchains or cryptocurrency and what have you that could do this or that on climate. We don't work with that. So when people come and they do that regularly and say, could you do something for me? I invented this thing that can help people control their power use in their homes. We have to say no because we don't have any competences in that field. If you look at us, a privately owned company established in 17 and has four affiliates. It's headquartered here where I live in Odense, a city in Denmark, and it has about 100 people. And we have been able to raise about $100 million capital, most of it from people who know us, and then a little from a pension fund and from a Danish utility. And that keeps us rolling. So... We're spending other people's money at the moment, but of course, with the hope to be able to pay them back with a nice interest once we start being successful. And this is how it works. I'm the CEO of the parent company. 
and that's a small thing. It has got legal uh, um, HR, um, a CFO, uh, somebody with communications and, and, and so on. But all the real work is done in, in the four subsidiaries, working with offshore systems, with storage, with power to X and with fuel technologies. And this thing about industrialization, that is really, really important. I have um, done, made many, many inventions in my career and have uh, many patents. But in reality, what brought down the cost of wind power was not all my ideas and inventions, it was industrialization. And this is one of the most famous uh, uh, examples of industrialization, the Model T car from Ford. This is how the selling price went of the Model T car. Um, it, it, it is a very famous study of learning curves. And the study was done in 58, so somewhat over 60 years ago. Um, and, 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 and everything was converted to 1958 dollars. And it's the original plot from the original report. So uh, um, it looks kind of old fashioned because it is old. Um, and what, what it does is that it plots the selling price as a function of the total accumulated number of cars that Ford had produced. So we can see that in 1909, they had produced about 15,000 cars and they cost something on the order of $3,300. Already in 10, they had produced a lot more. By 11, they had crossed the 100,000 mark. And by 15, they had crossed the 1 million mark. And the price just kept dropping. And the interesting thing is that it is the same product. So it's not so that they changed it all the time and made it more and more fancy and, and more and more a novel. It's the same product. There are a few cosmetic changes, but fundamentally it was the same thing. And they kept on improving the, the manufacturing. And when they, when they passed a million cars, Ford was the first company in the world that had ever reached a million of something big that was done industrially. Other things like a sewing machines and telephones and typewriters had been done in the millions, uh, guns, but not something, but they would weigh one, two, five kilograms, 10 kilograms, but not a ton. So Ford was the first player ever to produce something that weighed not fully a ton, but many hundred kilograms in a, the number of a million. And they must have, I think, and I don't know, I have no clue, but I guess they would have popped some champagne on that day and said, wow, we did a million. Now we are the champions. Now we know what we are doing. And we know now, no, guys, you didn't know what you were doing. Because when you have made 8 million cars, you will have shaved off another third of your price because of industrialization and making things more effective. And that is why industrializing is really the key to success. And if we take uh, offshore wind, which I've spent a lot, big part of my life in, that started out as a costly alternative and where the question essentially was and had to be, we like it, but how can we afford it? And now the last few years, it has got to a cost level where the question has turned to, how can we afford not to? Not because of patents, but because of innovation and industrialization. So let's take a look at what is happening in real life. Um, wind is going to grow enormously. This is what IEA, the International Energy Agency, expects what it takes to reach net zero by 2050. In other words, a situation where the net emissions from the, from the world are zero. Basically means that you need some negative emissions to compensate for unavoidable positive emissions that we cannot help making. We will always have emissions from agriculture and forestry and so on. Even if we were to make zero emission industry and transportation and, and energy production. So, um, but, but, but this is the term you use. In, interestingly, by the way, as I sit here and think about it, nobody spoke about zero emissions when they made the Paris Agreement in 2015. So it's a new 
concept that people are now speaking a lot about, including the International Energy Agency. Um, when they look at offshore wind, this is the growth. Uh, we did five gigawatts, 5,000 megawatts in 2020. We need to do 80 by 2030 per year. So we need to do 16 times as much as, as what we do, um, uh, what we did in 20. We need to do that by, by 30. Just for reference, in, uh, at the end of 20, the whole world had 36 gigawatts of offshore wind. So we need to install by 2030, somewhat over two times what we did in the first 30 years of the industry. And that, of course, um, it, it raises the obvious observation that the only way in the world we will ever get to do that is by industrialization. But then there's a challenge. We actually very successful in offshore wind. The last project that got permitted in Denmark did not have a big subsidy. It actually had no subsidy. It will pay the Danish government not a huge amount, but 300 million pounds, 300 30 million pounds over the first four or five years. So it's for the state, it's a money machine. And that is, of course, a big success. The problem is that we are successful in what is actually an outlier or an anomaly in the world. And there are a few others of those, like the Eastern seaboard of the US and the coast of China, but most of the world is normal, which means it has deep waters close to the big population centers. So in order to compensate for that, you work with floating offshore wind. But there is an issue with that. And that issue is that all of these designs tend to be made in shipyards. So these examples here, they will typically have on top of it, a highly industrialized machine mounted on something that's built by hand. And that's kind of strange. Um, the, the amount of working hours in a large wind turbine tower for a 15 megawatt machine. There are no 15 megawatt machines now, but they would be dominant in 2025. A 15 megawatt machine has a tower that takes about 5,000 working hours in total from steel plate to finished painted structure with interns. The floater that this 5,000 hour structure sits on is somewhat heavier. It's about three and a half times heavier than the tower. But it does not take three and a half times as much time to build. It takes 50 times. So instead of 5,000 hours, it takes 250,000 hours. And there you can say that if we need 80 gigawatts, that's something like 5,000 uh, um, uh, 15 megawatt turbines a year you cannot do that if each of the floaters takes 250,000 working hours. That simply won't happen. There are not welders in the world who can put in more than a billion working hours in a year. So that is what, something that I came to think of when I retired from Siemens. I retired at the end of 2014. And then I thought, what should I do? I'm not done with doing stuff. I just like to do something outside a big company. What should I do? Um, not something that competes with my old friends and colleagues in the company. Still had very good relations with them. What should I do? And then I looked around and said, and, and basically make the logic that I've just referred to here. You know, that must be solvable. And it is solvable. The conventional thinking is that you get charmed by a certain structure and then as a secondary thing, you think you get to think about how do we build it? What I did was I said, I know how to build it. Let's see what structure can I then construct. And it had to be done like you do with the turbines, everything done in the factory, assembled at the key site, um, in, install the turbine in the port and tow it out. You don't need a big installation vessel. Big installation vessels are a severe bottleneck in the industry. And this is really what it's all about. It's about the mindset. It's about thinking, how do we do things in a, in a different way? Um, and it turns out that you can actually do all kinds of, of floaters like this. You can do bottom fixed foundations that are not even floating. And you can do the different variants of floating. 
um, the floating world has has uh, three main um, uh, configurations. One is what we call a semi-submersible that gets its stability from water plane area of the of the floating structure. Another one is a tension leg platform or TLP that gets its stability from a balance between the the buoyancy on the structure and some strong anchors that keep keep the structure at a certain level below the sea surface. And the third one gets its stability from having a center of gravity below the center of buoyancy. And all three can be done um, using this uh, industrial approach. And we actually start out doing this one here. Um, the idea is from 16, from before the company was made. Once we had the company, we started doing tank testing. Um, we built the components for the prototype in 20 and we installed it last year. And I did not have anything like the money needed to do that. So I had the good luck to be able to um, secure the support from RWE, a big German energy company from Shell, that you all know, and from TEPCO, which is the largest Japanese utility. Um, they own 99% of the prototype and I own 1%. And uh, it has a 3.6130, a turbine on it. 130 meter rotor was 10 years ago, the largest on the market. Now it's a small rotor. We had it done by a Danish company called Welcome. And we actually did what we set out to do. We constructed it just in a simple port and towed it up to the uh, testing location. In the port, we used that piece of flat land. Uh, and when the picture was taken, there were wind turbine components stored there. When we came, it was empty. And we did not need a shipyard or a dry dock, we just built it there. And we did it as we set out to do in a tower factory. What we see here in the front is the center column of our foundation. What we see in the back are various shapes of towers uh, going through production. Took it out on, on, uh, on the road and drove it up to this port of embarkation where we clicked it together. We had developed a, a sort of pin joint that allowed us to assemble it um, using very little time. We ended up using uh, 35 crane hours altogether. This is our fastest brace that we installed. If we had been installing it by welding it, we would have, have needed first to fit the welding surfaces. They will never, you'll never be able to make them precisely fitting from the factory. Then we need to weld out in the open. When you do that, every now and then there'll be some wind that will blow away the protective gases. Then you need to, once you've done your NDT, you need to grind again to repair your weld. And then ultimately you would need to sandblast and paint minimum a week. In this case here from the member was lying on the ground and the cranes had their hooks on and they started revving up their diesels. And until it had been mounted, uh, fixed in place and the hooks were back on the ground again took not a week but 32 minutes so um, so it actually does work when you do things industrially here we are putting on the work platform and what you then do is that you take it out on a a semi-submersible barge and then you simply submerge the barge so the floater can float off here we take out the keel that gives us the ballast, mounting the turbine on the, on the structure. This is a, a dark because it had to be done in the night because it was done during a high wind period. And here we're done, ready for, for sailing out. And then we simply towed it up to Norway. On the way up, we lowered the keel and ballasted it so that when we arrived at the site, and, and our position is the green one, there was one old turbine then when we came and a new one is going in this year. But when we arrived, we were in that green position. Uh, we were fully ballasted. This is from the towing path. We had some interesting weather on the way, but it all worked out nicely. Here we have been installed and hooked up to the pre-laid anchors. Here we are laying the cable. And, um, and here we are operating. And the turbine actually, because it, it, it's a seamless turbine and a very robust 
standard model. Uh, from um, from it got we got the power connected and until it was operating it took three hours. We we don't have any credit for that. That's all down to Siemens, but that was of course really impressive. It has been running since then, which was early early December, and um, I just got today the report from March. In March we had 99.1% uh, availability, so uh, operating basically all the time, and we had a capacity factor of 62%. The capacity factor is uh, the ratio between what the turbine would have been producing if it was running all the time at rated power. Um, I should say what it actually produced divided by what it would have produced if it was running at rated power all the time. So we did 62 of the theoretical maximum. And that's very good. On average, offshore wind turbines do about 50%. Onshore turbines do about 35%. So 62% is, is really nice. And of course, that's down to the wind conditions. They have been good. But it's also there's also a downside to that, which is that when the wind is good, you can't get out there. In January, we had a, a total of one excess day. So you really need robust equipment when you're offshore. And the next one we're doing is a sub. Uh, this, it looks like this. And it's actually a big machine. It's for 15 megawatt. Uh, here I placed it on two football fields. So it's a big machine. There we are reaching new levels of loading. Some I've not seen before. Uh, we have bending moments that are measured now in a little over one giga newton meter. Um, and then of course you can say, what is a giga newton meter? I think we all know have an impression of a newton meter or ton meter. What is a giga newton meter? How do we get to that? And I have this example that I use, which I don't think is so necessary when we speak to an engineering forum, but for lay people, it is uh, often interesting to see. What if I took a long beam and placed the Tesla Model S two ton car at the end of that? How long does it need to be to get us to one giga newton meter? How long is that beam? And the answer, to, at least to some people's surprise, is 50 kilometers. So you have to imagine that you are standing somewhere 50 kilometers away. Somebody has a Tesla car. You place a long beam under the car, and you try to lift the car at your end. That's a bending moment that the tower base is seeing. Um, then you can say, OK, check. Now we can produce power, but then we have the problem of the intermittency. This is a two week period in, in Denmark. What we see on the plot is the load. So five working days, two weekend days, five working days, two weekend days. And this is what's called the cooking peak. So people tend to cook at the same time every evening. And what we see here is the wind power production. That's the blue part. Solar PV, yellow. Decentral heat and power, that's the sort of lighter blue, and the gray curve is central heat and power. And when there is a, a lack, we import from Norway, Sweden, or Germany. When there's excess, we export. Here there's an excess. Mostly in this period, we import some. Um, and as you can see, the wind power is our own dominant source, but it's very variable. We could look at a situation where we, we look at this problem set, not enough, not the right time, back off from solar PV, doesn't work. And say, let's get some more wind. So now I have introduced so much more wind that we get our load covered 100%. So now, we have, oh, now we have enough, um, but we don't have it. Oh, oh yes, I should say that here I have, you are kind of exceeding the axis. So now I've adjusted the axis. So we get it all to be on the, on the plot. And what we can see here is now we get enough, but it's still not at the right time. And solar PV that are also increased by a factor of two uh, is not the answer. We have these long gaps of no wind, short gaps of no wind. We need to have a solution to that. And that's why we work on energy storage. We need to store electricity. Um, how much do we need? And that in Denmark, and this is a, a plot for Denmark, the curve looks like this. 
up to about 40% wind penetration, we can use all of it. So if we have 40% on the x-axis, we can get our 40% of our load covered. But then it bends off. And if we have 100%, in other words, if we have the same 36 billion kilowatt hours as we use every year in Denmark, if we produce 36 uh, billion kilowatt hours, we only get about 60% of our load covered. And going to 72 billion kilowatt hours only gets us close to 70%, but we don't cover the rest. If we have one day of storage, we get there. 10 days of storage gets us there. 100 days of storage, then we can power the whole country on purely wind. And what you will observe is that it's not like 100% gives us then 100%. There's a gap. And that's because any storage system has a loss. This is representing the loss. So we actually need about 145% to compensate for, to get us to 100% load. If we look at, at the various technologies available, then there are some that have durations of minutes, but that doesn't help if we need duration of a day. Even batteries don't get us to a day. The only thing that does is pumped hydro. Well, good luck if you are in Denmark when there are no mountains or hydrogen. And therefore we have developed a thermal energy storage system. The thermal energy storage system works by heating crushed rock to a high temperature when we have excess wind power and then heating air by flowing through that crushed rock when we have um, when we have no wind and using that hot air to drive a turbine. So that's how it works. You can think of it as short-term, mid-term and seasonal. Uh, you, can, you could of course say, well, if hydrogen covers seasonal and actually could cover also short-term, why don't we just use hydrogen or for that matter, ammonia all the time? But the reason is that the round trip efficiency of thermal can be made much higher than for hydrogen. And here we are working on, on our, our storage tank. What we do is that we store the energy in hot rocks uh, that are kept in, in a pressurized tank. And here are some examples of tank testing. The one on the left is at the Danish Technical University. The one on the right is at our facilities elsewhere in Denmark. And, and this is a rendering of our first project that we are building with a bit of luck this year together with a Danish utility, um, two hot tanks, two cold tanks. And what we do when we heat it is that we use a heat pump arrangement, where we pump heat from the hot tank, from the cold tanks to the hot tanks. So we get a COP or coefficient of performance during heating of about 3.25. And then when we discharge, we discharge to air turbines that give us an efficiency of around uh, 20% or so. When we multiply the two, we get to something like 65%, but then we have some losses in the piping and so on, and we end around 60%. What you see on the left is part of the tubo machinery to, to do this heat pump arrangement. They're made by uh, the German uh, compressor maker Atlas Copco. Um, actually, they might be Swedish, but they, they, this factory is in Germany. Um, they are the leading manufacturer of turbo machinery for things like this. And of course, the ideal situation is that we could do 24-7 um, solar power. It, it is more difficult to do 24-7 wind power because the cycle in solar is one day the cycle in, in wind tends to be a, a four, about four days duration. So in the long run, we'll also get to four days. We are starting out focusing more on the one day storage duration. Then of course, and I apologize, I can see now certainly that this is in Danish, but the green thing is farming, transport industry. You can see that outfall is waste and you can see energy. When we do look forward to 2030, we actually successful on energy. Energy has very little emissions. This is an emission sharing plot, but farming, transport and industry still will have a lot of emission. And that's why we do hydrogen. 
Um, the only way from electricity through, through to fuels of all kinds of, of, of uh, constructions is through an electrolyzer. You can make fuels in other ways, like with biomass and so on. But if you want to start with electricity, the only way to get to a fuel is through an electrolyzer. And then we will have looked around for electrolyzers. Okay, we need to, to also see what is happening there. They are big, complex, very, very much non-industrialized pieces of equipment. If you look on the one on the, on the right, this is what we call the electrode stack. This is where the electrodes are that produce a hydrogen and oxygen. And this is the fun part. And people tend to focus a lot on that. And that's what you see pictures of. But this part, the balance of plant, is actually more costly than the stack. And as you can see, it is the sweet dream of somebody who is supplying stainless steel fittings. It is done in a way in a, in a non-industrialized way that we will never ever do in a wind turbine. You will never see a hydraulic system or anything that has to, has to do with fluids in a wind turbine being built like that or being built like the one on the, on the left. It's just not done. It's done in a much more compact, um, simple manner because simplicity is God. And it doesn't need to be like that. So we have developed the, at this self-contained uh, electrolyzer unit that will bring the cost of electrolyzers down from today about 850 euros. What is that? 750 pounds per kilowatt down to about 200 pounds per kilowatt. And the trick is super simple. It is not to be super innovative on the technology, just like we were not very innovative on, on the floater. It looks like other floaters, but it is about doing it industrially. And here we have our first model of that. That's 150 kilowatt unit. It can do up to one megawatt and it's done like an industrial machine. And that is this super simple trick. And it is actually no trick, but the surprising thing is that it is not what is being done today. And here we have some renderings of of units with, on the left standing at a solar farm, on the left standing on the shore, or maybe on a wind island, as we call it, next to offshore. We think a three megawatt unit could very well become a standard, and that's what these pictures show. Um, the kind of long things that go up on, on these gadgets are venting openings. The one on the left for oxygen, which is when you produce hydrogen, is just vented. The one on the right for venting hydrogen if something should happen and they need to be far from each other in order not to mix. And that's why you have these uh, venting pipes. Then we have a challenge. And that challenge is that while most of the transportation sector can be, can be served either by electricity or by non-carbon fuels, such as hydrogen ammonia, aviation cannot. Aircraft are fully dimensioned by, by uh, um, the weight of the fuel, and they cannot live with the weight of, of uh, ammonia, which is twice that of, of uh, kerosene per heat of combustion. They cannot live with hydrogen. That is in itself very lightweight, but uh, has a problem that it doesn't want to liquefy. So it has to be transported in pressure tanks, and therefore the weight of hydrogen is also high. So aircraft need carbon fuels. And carbon fuels for aircraft basically means kerosene, which is a band of hydrocarbons that is, as, as I'm sure you know, you, on the low end, we have propane and butane. And then we have uh, 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 hydrocarbons around octane. So having seven, eight, nine um, carbon atoms that we use that for, for petrol, for cars. And, and then we have um, kerosene, which centers around the dodecane, so with 12 atoms of carbon. And then you have the longer chains that are diesel and even longer heavy fuel and so on. We need to be able to make dodecane for, for aviation. And that's what we do in the last company, the fuel technologies company. 
Um, what we do there is actually that we, we work with agricultural waste. Um, the, 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 the nature is so arranged that all the carbon that exists in plants is absorbed from the air through photosynthesis. So what plants do is that they capture CO2 from the air, cut the, the, the bond, uh, let out the O2 and keep the C in the CO2. And they use that carbon to build up sugars. And from those sugars, they both get their energy for, for their metabolism and for the things they do. And they build up complex structures such as cellulose and lignin and starch and so on. Um, each and every carbon atom comes from the atmosphere. Nothing from, from water, nothing from fertilizers. It's all done by photosynthesis. And that means that all plant waste also has all of its carbon captured as CO2. Within, within mulch it, we could also burn it. Then, of course, it becomes CO2 again. But when we mulch it, it's eaten by soil microorganisms. And through their met metabolism, it's again emitted as CO2. This is the natural cycle. What we do in our uh, project is that we interrupt that cycle. We cannot do anything about the natural part, but instead of mulching the waste, we put it into a pyrolysis oven. And what happens there is pyrolysis simply means heating it to high temperature without oxygen being present. And as a result of that, about 50% of the carbon goes off as a gas. Part of that gas can be condensed into an oil. Part of it cannot be condensed, but you can use it for other purposes. And that essentially makes a fuel. And that fuel, uh, of course, when combusted, goes back to the atmosphere again as CO2. But half of the carbon does not want to go off as a gas. And that simply becomes carbonized. It gets to look like black carbon. Um, and it then has the same characteristics of black carbon. And the characteristics include that there's no bacteria in the world that eat it. And that means that you can, you can store it on agricultural land. You can simply spread it over land. Uh, it will uh, not decompose. It has taken with it all the nutrients of the waste uh, not uh, built into molecules, but just being absorbed as salts on the outside of the carbon. That means that that leaches off um, and serves as a fertilizer. When we then combust our, our fuel, we of course leave it back as CO2. But since we took away something, we need some more CO2 to run the cycle once more. And that means that because we have this sink, we need a source of carbon or CO2 from the atmosphere. And then we get to the paradox that the more fuel we produce, the more CO2 we take away from the atmosphere. Therefore, I say mainly as a joke, but not fully as a joke, be a good citizen, take some more vacation in Thailand, fly as much as you can. As long as the airplane is powered by my fuel, we take away CO2 from the atmosphere. We can use anything. This is in, in, in sequence uh, rice, straw and rice shells, uh, maize and wheat, straw, anything other that you have as residue, we can use uh, wood chips, we can use waste from uh, palm oil plantations, we can use um, animal manure, we can use anything. We can use uh, seaweed, we can use anything that's green in the origin. We could also use black stuff like plastics or car tires, but that would not serve to, to kind of, of, of uh, uh, run this cycle into something that could be spread on agricultural land. Then it would need to be sequestered and always afterwards. And this is how it looks. Uh, what we have is uh, uh, pellets of our feedstock. It could be on this picture, straw or manure. And then we get out biochar pellets that look like what came in, just smaller. And then the bio oil, and I did not find a way to show the gas on the picture. And this is how it works. Um, I have had this idea for since 2009, 
when I kind of thought of this is a way we can get CO2 out of the atmosphere. But until 19, I had not solved the issue that when you do this biochar, there's a risk that you get tar residues sitting on the char. And then purely by chance, I met some people from the Danish Technical University and it turned out that they had a plant that could do what I was after. So the way it works is that you get the feedstock into a conveyor and drops into this bed. And there it gradually moves down as it gets carbonized. And ultimately it rests on a grate here. And every now and then the grate opens and then it falls into a, another conveyor and is taken away. The gas that goes off, goes off here and then it's split in a, a T-tube. Part of it goes away as the useful part of the gas is filtered and goes out as pure gas. Part of it is recirculated through a fan and up here and down through a, a heating chamber. Where it's heated by a, a heating element. It goes in and enters the bed from the bottom and drives the cycle. All of this with no, no oxygen being present. And the trick is that because the bed is moving down, the biochar sees as the last thing before it leaves the bed, it sees the hottest gas. As the char is heated or the feedstock is heated, the gas is of course cooled. So it's like 550 degrees here, oh sorry, 400 degrees when it leaves up here. And tar only sits on the biochar through condensation. So by having the char being hotter than anything else, just when it leaves the furnace, you arrive at the very good uh, um, result that there are no tar residues on the char. You can safely spread it on agricultural land. You can even use it as, as a, an additive to cattle feed because cattle make less methane if they also ingest some biochar. This principle of the counter current, the, the uh, feedstock moving down, the air, the gas moving up, is something that they figured out at DGU. And that's what we use in our system. What they have is a, a plant that is used for education and for training and for science and so on. Therefore, we have built our own 200 kilowatt plant that was commissioned last year. This is little me, the guy who is the chair of, who is the CEO of the fuel company and the two blacksmiths who built it and some politicians who were present. Uh, and um, about a month ago, we commissioned our first 10 times larger unit. Uh, this is actually the Danish crown prince, little me, the same CEO and two ministers, climate and agriculture present at the event. This is how the plant looks on the inside. So this is a two megawatt plant. It eats about 5,000 tons of feedstock a year. And it, it, it sequesters about the same amount of CO2 from the atmosphere. So this is a genuine carbon negative piece of equipment. Um, with the pyrolysis gas, we can do three things. We can either simply burn it. Um, in order to do that, you need a heated pipe. Um, and then you can feed it to some industrial plant. The reason the pipe needs to be heated is that if it's not heated, part of the uh, liquids will condense on the inside. So you need to have it hot on the way. Or you could simply condense out the oils. So get your bio oil, uh, pass that through a refinery and get some fuel and use the gas for power and heat. Or you could add some green hydrogen after you have cracked the gas. So instead of cooling it to a condenser, you heat it to about a thousand degrees then it decomposes into short chains of carbon. Uh, uh, carbon sometimes uh, the most uh, uh, common constituent is carbon monoxide. Uh, we get that out as what we call a syngas, and out of that we can make methanol, and that's a very good precursor, not only for jet fuel, but also for, for instance, plastics. This is how it looks when we look at the energy. So uh, we put two megawatts in, we get a little over uh, one megawatt out as volatiles, and we get a little less than one megawatt out as a char, which is the sequestered part. This is with straw. If we do it with biogas fibers, we get a little more out as gases, and we get a little less out as sequestered carbon. 
all of it needs a little parasitic uh, heating here for to, to drive the process and there's a little fan and this is lost as as waste heat that you can use for for uh, district heating and it does a lot more things um, it actually avoids methane emissions and it also helps remove the parts that we do for uh, that we get in modern agriculture such as hormones and pesticides and so on but it leaves the nutrients ready for for um, for use by plants it has good soil improvement effects this is the carbon effect in, in denmark as we predicted this thing alone will give us 7 million tons in denmark by 2030 and on a global scale and now we get back to this question about carbon negative this is a IPCC plot, they are less ambitious than IEA. IEA wanted us to reach net zero at 2050. IPCC says 2090. But in order to get there, we need these gross negative CO2 emissions. We simply need to take CO2 away from the atmosphere. And this thing that I showed you here is a good bit for it. So that's what we do in the company. Then sometimes when I'm, I'm giving a, a speech like this, people say, and what, but what do you do about innovation and how do you make people want to do what you speak about? And therefore, I've introduced today a little about how we go about it. Um, we have a very simple leadership approach uh, that we think fosters innovation. It's something that I have cooked up. I actually stole uh, the three first items from some American leadership person. I don't know. It's only something I heard. I actually don't know who it is. I just thought it fitted well. The last two is, I think, that I figured out myself. Purpose, mastery, autonomy. That is what keeps uh, engineers happy. We need to know what it's good for. We need to know that what we do serves a good purpose. We need to feel that we are actually good at what we do. That's a really heady feeling that what you do you actually are good at what you spend your time on. It's just a sweet feeling. I work, used to work long before Siemens. I worked first with Vestas from 79 and then with the forerunner of Siemens Wind Power Bonus Energy in Denmark from 87. We sold the company to Siemens in 2004. And these small Danish companies, they were actually able to compete with General Electric and Mitsubishi and what have you. And that just felt good. We were good at what we were doing. That was a, a, a fantastic feeling. And once you do your work properly, you need to be empowered. There should be no micromanagement. And then we have the other two, appreciation. That's basically that um, uh, appreciating what your people are doing is better than blaming them when it's not to your liking. Scolding is not as good as praise. You should always only use praise. So that's really very simple. And then there's the rationality. And what I say here is that it's actually about the absence of irrationality. And the demonstration that we know that people are not stupid and they can remember what we said. Um, and sometimes people, when I speak about this, will say, well, you say it's about the absence of irrationality. Isn't that the same as the presence of rationality? But actually, it is not. Um, and and when, I, when I speak about this, I use the example not from engineering, but from one of my uh, old friends, uh, who is a, a lead doctor at a Danish, last Danish hospital. He has a very rational, successful everyday. He is he's in, he's a cardiologist and he's in charge of the, um, um, the what would you call it the substance of what they do. There's another doctor who is who is in charge of the people, but my friend is in charge of all the all the scientific and, and technical parts of cardiology at this big hospital. And he has a very successful day and a very uh, rational day. He gets in in the morning, they have a morning conference, he sees the patients, he has uh, those who are in day, day service, they have a midday conference, he does this or that. 
it's all great. And they are very successful. Here in Denmark, the mortality from cardiac arrest used to be like 65% would die, something like that. Now 5% die. People used to be in, in bed in hospital for so many days if they had had a heart attack. Now they basically get home the day after and so on. They are on all technical counts successful. The productivity is higher than it ever was. And then his lords and masters come and say, oh, by the way, you need a new quality system. And then they say, uh, why? We have a quality system. It works really well. And they say, yeah, but we'd like to harmonize with something, whatever. Say, so why do we want to harmonize? And what has that to do with us? Yeah, but we decided to do that. Say, so, you know, we are short of nurses. Why do you want to take our, our, away? Our, oh, yeah, we forgot to tell you that you all need to go on six weeks training on something. And they don't say the last part, but they should say on something you don't need because you already have a well-functioning system. This takes 3% of his day and spoils his, his joy. And so he has 97% rational, 3% irrational, and that kind of overwhelms everything. So that is really a fundamental thing for those of us who, who have got to do with people. And then finally, the last thing I'm going to speak about is a little about the mindset. And that's why I spoke with, with uh, uh, the organizers about uh, uh, sharing this, because nobody can, can kind of get it in from the screen. What this is, is a summary of what I thought we were doing in the company earlier on, but which became more difficult to convey to people as we grew. When I joined this Danish precursor of Siemens Wind Power in, in 1987, we were nine people in, in engineering. When Siemens took over, we were about 80. And when I retired, we were about 1,000. And of course, that made changes to how you could communicate. Uh, because in the old days, we would have lunch together and chat over the food and chat on the, at the coffee machine and so on. And as a group, you just couldn't do that. In 2010, we had lean introduced in engineering, which was very nice. And then I thought, here's an opportunity to make kind of a little handbook. This is what was in that handbook. It's about how you work with innovation. And here are many things that most of you will recognize and say, oh, yes, that's how we do it. But some of them are not so easy, particularly not for, for young people. If you take the initiative, you have the initiative obligation. If you are in doubt about what you should be doing, then ask. Don't just do it and hope that it was the right thing. And you also need to react when other people don't provide the information. I try to teach the people to ask why not. Why, why can't we do it faster? What is it actually that's keeping up us back? Why do we end up doing things in a sequence instead of parallel? The top-down thing, very, very importantly, identify the technical issues and then group them into something that is, I call it digital, but that's not about something being on computers. Or so it's about digital being one or zero. So it's either or, it's go or no go. Some of the th questions you have are of that nature, then you should solve those first. Because if you end up with a no-go decision, then you have wasted your time on all the analog things. You need to tackle the digital first. Face the facts always bring problems to the surface. You need to know what you're speaking about. Do small experiments. Oh, you all, of, all of you know that. Keep it real, know your references. That's trivial. Keep it simple. That's the most difficult thing for engineers. I often ran, a, not often, I, sometimes I ran a, a little exercise. Um, if you look at a wind turbine hub where the blades are mounted, the blades are mounted on big turntable bearings, big board bearings that allow the blades to be turned on the hub to face the wind or to be, we call it feathered, so that they just don't produce any power or anything. In such a hop, you, can, you could count, you would say, there is a hop, then there is a bearing that's kept in place by a bolt, nut, and washer. So that's five lines on the bill of material. Then there's the other ring of the bearing that's joined to the blade. So it has a blade, a bolt, a nut, a washer. So that's like nine. Then we have the 
things where the hydraulic cylinders that do the movement of the blade are fitted. So that's like a, 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 a stop with a shaft and a locking pin and two dishes. So that's like 13 hydraulic cylinder, same pin on the other end. That's not a new line. Then you have two hydraulic hoses, that's 16. Then you have some sensors, you have a controller, you have a line to the hydraulics in the nacelle. You end up with 30 line numbers. And in reality, there are 300. Say, why? Yeah, but it just happened like that. Then sometimes I run this exercise where I say, okay, can you leanify it? Can you make it simpler? Spend an hour, I come back, let's see. Then they spend an hour, I come back, and then there are not 300, but 330 lines. Because in the process, they came to think that they should actually also measure this or that, because that would be interesting. And they could improve on this or that by adding that other gadget. So even in that exercise, they end up having more parts. So things grow, that goes for processes, that, grow, that goes for, for equipment, grow by themselves they follow the second law of thermodynamics. Left to its own, entropy grows. If you want to make, take entropy down, you need to spend energy. And that, that's where my advice is simply spend that energy. Respect Murphy's law. If anything can go wrong, it will. And then of course, this thing about teamwork. Um, live, and give a, live a culture of giving and taking challenge in good spirit. It's not about others as persons. It's about others, what, what they say and do, and always go to it in a positive manner. So these are the, the few bits of, of sort of how to do it advice that I've been able to think about over the years. This is how we, how we work, actually, how, what's coming out of it. I started by doing the offshore part. I, then come the, came the stories, then came hydrogen, then came the fuel. This is how it looks at the moment about getting to our 500 million tons. We are not there fully. We are at 482 million tons with our present growth plans, but almost there. And I think we can accelerate. The interesting observation is, of course, that hydrogen is the most important. That's simply because it can be industrialized faster than the others. To do an offshore project has an eight year planning horizon. It's completely bizarre. It's completely irrational, but that's how it is. So in Scotland, they announced uh, that they have in for Scotland appointed 15 gigawatts, fantastic floating wind, super, to be installed year after 2030. Why? Because that's just how it is. Whereas with hydrogen, to a slightly lesser extent, but still with still quite good with the agricultural waste turning into fuel, the planning horizon is much, much, much shorter. So it's much easier to get a big volume on it. So getting back to the anecdote, the house is on fire. What do you do? You stand there with, your, with the hose. And of course, what you do is you turn on the water. You actually do something, even if people say there is no fire or my windows are getting, are getting misty. You turn on the, on the, the water. When you do that, you're up against a lot of inertia. This is a, 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 a billboard from the US. Um, one of the things is that there are way too many men like me, uh, and they are stubborn. They don't want to change the planning process. And this uh, billboard actually came up from the Food and Drug Administration. It had to do with the fact that men are bad at recognizing, or shall we say, acting on symptoms of cancer. The wife will tell them, oh, oh for Christ's sake, go to the doctor. Ah, yeah, no, I can work it away. Uh, and there are things you can't work away. And then there was this fantastic graffiti uh, about men. Um, so sometimes I think we need some more females into our decision making. But of course, we are in for a big transformation. And sometimes people say, you can't just transform the energy sector. You can't just transform the, the industry to use climate-friendly things. But I think you can. And this is a, a fun picture. Uh, Fifth Avenue, Easter Sunday, so close to 122 years ago. Um, and you can play a game, say, spot the car. There's one car in the picture. 
and you can find it if you look closely. It's difficult. I didn't find it when I saw it first. It's there. There's one car. And then you look at the same picture, not quite from the same vantage point, but still Easter Sunday in 1913. And then you can play the game of saying, spot the horse. There's one horse. It's there. And this transformation, totally radical, did not happen because everyone wanted to, it to happen. A lot of people didn't want it to happen. In the year 1900, New York had about 100,000 people feeding, driving with, stabling, buying, selling, slaughtering horses, sweeping up manure. They didn't want this, but it happened nevertheless. So the bottom line is that if we work hard enough, things will happen. And, and that's what I hope uh, we will do. We do that in my little company. Unfortunately, a lot of other people are doing it. And, and that's, of course, what we should be doing. So that's what I had on the on the on the agenda for for tonight. Uh, I'll stop sharing, and then let's see if there are any questions. Oh, thank you, thank you very much.